Over the last few years, we've witnessed the rise of two disturbing phenomena in the United States. One, the rise of mass shootings. Just one year ago in Las Vegas, the deadliest in modern history, 58 people were mercilessly gunned down from a hotel window, with hundreds left injured. The conversation of gun control occupies a few days of media space and then goes away until the next mass shooting. At least 58 people. More than 20 people are dead. Shooting rampage into Hama County. And has gone on a killing spree. At least 17 people have been killed. The shooter has on body armor. Gunman opened fire at a Waffle House. He used his dad's shotgun. There are multiple fatalities. At a video game tournament. Three victims killed. Bakersfield tonight following a shooting spree. Three people have been killed in that mass shooting. Shooting at a Kroger grocery store. Twelve people who have been shot. Shooting at a yoga studio. Killing at least 12 people. If that weren't terrifying enough, this coincides with the resurgence of the neo-Nazi and white supremacist movement, itself heavily armed and calling for violence. Sometimes the two trends overlap. But America's addiction to guns, the mass shooting epidemic, and the burgeoning armed right wing are much more deeply connected than is being acknowledged. And if either threat is to be solved or even diminished, there must be an honest analysis of U.S. history and culture. So I met with scholar Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, who just wrote a new book, Loaded, a disarming history of the Second Amendment, to find out how we got here, or if we've always been this way. So before we get into the history, Roxanne, uh, as we sit down for this interview, there have been three far right wing uh, attacks just in the last week. We had uh, a white supremacist shooting two black Americans at a Kroger store. Um, then we had the pipe bombs sent to prominent Democrats. And of course, just yesterday, this horrific shooting at the synagogue that left 11 people murdered. Um, of course, there have also been many more hate crimes uh, as of late and an increase under the Trump administration. What is your reaction to this wave of violence? Well, it does seem like it's um, accelerated, the ideological ones. Um, you can say before we had uh, clearly, you know, some problematic people like Cho at uh, Virginia Tech, um, the young man who was at Sandy Hook. There seems to be more ideological um, right-wing nationalism that has been, has a platform now with Trump. He uses their, um, their code words, their language, including the okay thing and um, uh, the anti-Semitic uh, globalism and um, attacking Soros. And this is just, uh, you know, just the code. So I think in the general public, um, we, we don't, we think it's stupid or we think it's wrong or even right wing, but we don't necessarily jump to saying that's hate language. But the people who are in these white nationalist organizations, uh, they, they of course know and they applaud, you know. Okay, I don't know anything about what you're even talking about with uh, white supremacy or white supremacists. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Did, did he endorse me? Okay, I mean, I'm just talking about David Duke and the Ku Klux Klan here, but. I don't know, any, honestly, I don't know David Duke. I don't believe I've ever met him. They have a word. It sort of became old fashioned. It's called a nationalist. And I say, really, we're not supposed to use that word. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? I'm a He'll go to a person holding a sign who gets paid by Soros or somebody, right? That's what happens. We must replace the present policy of globalism and replace it with a new policy, America first. Remember that. We are not going to let the United States be taken advantage of anymore. I am always going to put America first the same way that I expect all of you in this room to put your countries first. 
From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. It's going to be only America first. America first. They've never been really quite as um, triumphant uh, since the 1920s when the Klan had got about three million people as members and voted and actually marched on Fifth Avenue, a million of them. Uh, so that, you know, that was in that buildup of time to state uh, fascism. It really looks like the same kind of thing. And I think if we step back from um, uh, the obvious trauma and horror of it all and seemingly irrationality, and how did we get here, we have to understand the trajectory of capitalism and when it, when it no longer has a use, which has been now about a century, uh, you know, if it had any use, but let's let's give it that that it had this amazing um, uh, ability to take better care of humanity. Well, it lost that that possibility. It spun out. You know, it was really no longer. It was artificial after that. It was built up by the. And you notice how every day we watch uh, the main news is is watching like you know these barometers of the of the stock market and the job this wasn't necessary under uh, thriving um, buoyant capitalism which depended on looting and colonialism this when colonialism formal colonialism ended uh, this is very traumatic to um, uh, and it began ending in the 1920s. The writing was on the wall for colonialism. So capitalism has tends to become fascism when you know when it no longer has uh, something to really offer, um, say uh, uh, most of the people. So I think we need to dig deeper into you know how these patterns go and then also just into the history of the united states it's it's been building up and uh, you can look back and see the um, uh, tendencies and the 80s a huge surge under reagan of um, uh, white nationalist organizations forming a resurgence of the Klan. Uh, attracting lots and lots of disaffected young street kids white kids uh, who are now, you know, in charge of these organizations. You mentioned Trump's dog whistles constantly to yeah. these people. And I'm glad that you brought up the rhetoric because, you know, uh, let's just say Charlottesville, for example, saying there's good people on both sides, couldn't even condemn neo-Nazis that had killed someone. And then we move on to the MAGA bomber, right, this attempted uh, bombing of these prominent Democrats. Trump's reaction to that was very telling as well. He essentially blamed the media itself yeah. for inciting this. Why do you think Trump is doing this, Roxanne? I, I do think, or I've heard, um, apparently there's some documentation that he had uh, Mussolini's <laughs> translation of Mussolini on his uh, bedstand, you know, that he's, he has studied how others have, have done this. And he's probably also, you know, I mean, they say he doesn't read, but I think he probably does read things like that. He has embodied this, and I think he has his own instincts, and he's been acting it out as a, um, a real estate man. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting for me observing uh, Trump's behavior every day and his, um, his, the way he's made his money and all, and he's, he, he's so much like a, um, um, I mean, people are kind of shocked when I say this, like George Washington you know, this real estate uh, crook that was taking, uh, with militias going out and, and um, surveying Indian land and then coming back and selling it. And when it, he didn't own it, it was, you know, it was, it, but he made pieces of paper and sold it. And that's how he started that when he was 22 years old. And he became very, very wealthy on real estate. He, of course, he also had slaves in a plantation, but, this was his main work, and 
So these real estate men actually started the United States because they were all into real estate. Alexander Hamilton, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Washington was the oldest and best one to develop it. And what that did was develop capitalism being the first, you know, U.S. being the first capitalist state uh, formed as such on Lockean principles. Um, actually um, uh, developed on real estate, which is unusual. It, it didn't, you know, on, on the selling of land. The sacredness of the land for the settler is its value. You know, it's, it's uh, to sell it, to buy it, to sell it, to turn it over, because that's how capitalism works. You have to keep turning it over. You don't want people just to have something and just enjoy it the rest of their lives. Um, so I think there, you know, there's so much in our culture that, that really is available to um, a fascist kind of formation. It doesn't have, have to be that way, but because it's so dependent on um, the idea of anyone can make it, you know, that, that the, living, the, the playing field is level. Not everyone's equal, but they have equal opportunity. And that's always been a lie, but it's never more so than, than now, you know, with the income inequality. That has to somehow be maintained. In a way, Trump is kind of the perfect manifestation of what America really represents, from yeah. being the top landlord to the reality star obsession to, you know, this language that we're talking about, Roxanne. It's all predicated on deep-rooted white supremacist, yeah. settler colonial... We're back to the beginning. We're back to the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back. Because history's gun culture is based on the Second Amendment, right? Uh, the Second Amendment's right to bear arms, to have a well-regulated militia. What does that mean? I mean, talk about, first of all, talk about America's gun culture and why the Second Amendment was in the Bill of Rights. Yeah, the uh, gun culture already existed when the United States became independent. Uh, in the colonies, uh, Virginia and Massachusetts Bay were the big colonies uh, in the early 16th century. And in the 1620s, even in the 20s, the 30s, 40s, they made gun laws. Um, it's interesting, they made gun laws um, in those colonies that every settler male had to have a firearm and a certain amount, they actually had amounts, like so many pounds of gunpowder and so many bullets to load. And they were not to leave their house without their weapons or be in any public place, including church, without their firearms. And this was in the 1600s. They had no... Uh, no other enemy than the Indians whose land they had taken, who were still on their periphery and they were wanting to take more of that land. So this was purely made, this Second Amendment, this was, so this was practiced throughout the requirement. The requirement kind of morphed into a right. There was, you know, this, this sense that the, the only way to take land away from people who are resisting, who are on it and resisting, is by uh, counterinsurgency, by, you know, uh, what counterinsurgency is, is um, not fighting soldiers, but killing civilians, uh, burning their crops, burning their villages, uh, cutting off their roads, their ability to move, um, raping and maiming and, you know, the, the highest level of violence as possible to drive people out, those who are, uh, survive this mayhem. And armies, they, they couldn't, they actually weren't big enough. They couldn't get enough, uh, the idea of getting enough soldiers to do what individual settlers could do by their own desire not being required or conscripted, but their desire to take that land. Because once they took it, it was theirs. So gun rights were never for all Americans. 
They weren't. They were for um, they were for a purpose. Uh, they're autonomous settlers organizing themselves with a clear purpose to take land and get rich. Uh, so that's the dance, you know, of the of the government. Then they somehow wanted to put some restrictions, and yet they didn't want to. They knew they would still need the settlers because they already had this perspective of, you know, going to the Pacific Ocean, you know, the, they had the maps already mapped out in the Northwest Ordinance. So I think, you know, the Second Amendment was simply a validation of what already existed, these militias that already existed and the slave patrols that already existed. It's like you don't give that up, you know, that sense of being a settler and having those rights. That's really what white nationalism is. You know, it's it's the settler's right uh, for um, priority. And they talk in terms of um, uh, welcoming, you know, proper immigrants, but they're always the other unless they can culturally you know, come to be uh, the settler, have that mentality. And um, it, you know, there are all these books on how this or that group became white, how Jews became white, how Italians became white, how the Irish became white. But it's really how they became settlers. The more they can express that white nationalism and be with it, the more likely they, they are to be kind of accepted in it. and. That's a process going on now, and so it's really available to anyone. You still call it white nationalism, but it's still, you know, it, it can take other people in now. It's not just white people. So there's this revered history of militias in general. I mean, there's even high school mascots of militia people across this country. But you're talking about the real history of what these militias did. I wanted you to expand on that, and also how did they manifest into organizations like the KKK? So in the colonial, in the, in the colonies, like the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, the, uh, these vicious militias who would, you know, go and burn the crops and, um, and uh, burn the storage uh, places for food. And these were all farmers, the native people east of the Mississippi, they were all farmers. They were out, you know, out in the woods hunting. They, they were, they had villages and everything. So they were very vulnerable to, um, when they got to the plains, it was a different thing. You know, people who were herdsmen or um, were nomadic uh, and, and uh, uh, not so easy to burn there because they could move fast. They could change places. And um, But east of the Mississippi was just like Ireland uh, of, you know, just, just farmers and villages to burn down. So they really used those, those same methods. So that was like from 1607 to independence, 1785. That's a long period of time that they formed these things. But you can have a, a good um, understanding of how they worked as slave patrols. Um, I mean, a very vivid, clear line. They worked this way with native people too, but people know less about that history. But the militias that were slave patrols in the South um, were textbook militias. They were not paid, they're voluntary militias. They're not the same as uh, constables, you know, what we call police now, for to police the white population. They were purely for, you know, to, um, inspect any stray black person, especially a stray black young man. And this tells you what, you know, how the police connection today um, is assumed to be a fugitive, a runaway, unless they can prove otherwise. During the Cotton Kingdom, they would post all over, even all over the North, any escaped slave um, that and with the Dred Scott decision, um, every citizen, every white citizen, had the obligation uh, to turn that person in. So in a way, they 
They made everyone a part of the slave patrols. Was the whole culture was, revolved around controlling um, uh, the enslaved Africans. So when the Civil War came, these um, militias continued as best they could, you know, to keep slaves from running away, to, you know, and the war built up and that became difficult, but they didn't ever disband as slave patrols. What happened is six months after the end of the Civil War, uh, before really Reconstruction got going, um, the Ku Klux Klan formed. What they did was reassemble the slave patrols all over the South, but they were now illegal, so they, they put hoods on. Uh, but one general said, um, about halfway through Reconstruction, he said, the Klan is so pervasive in all of the former Confederate states that it would take uh, 10 times as many divisions of the U.S. Army that exists to control them. And everyone said, that's amazing. How did they organize so fast? How did they do that? Well, they were already organized. They were militias with hoods on. And then with Reconstruction, I mean, with uh, when the Union Army left, um, they took the hoods off and became the sheriff and the police and the convict, you know, the, the jail keepers. Um, and this is then the formation of modern um, police forces. It's like a DNA, you know, a social DNA that goes back to the slave patrols. Now the, the analogy to that um, that's more complicated because people don't know that much about, you know, the Indian Wars and, and uh, the indigenous people are still here and have a land base is that um, is, you know, in the center of that is like Idaho, Montana, Nevada, uh, Wyoming, that area, uh, and the eastern part of Oregon and Washington is this, um, is, is kind of the heartland of the descend, descendants of the Indian militias. They run their cattle on federal land because almost all that land in that area is federal land. And the reason it's federal land is it was never legally taken from the Native nations mm -hmm. by treaty. It was simply occupied. So legally, they can't, they can't privatize it. They can't sell it. So it's like three-fourths of the land in those states and also in, in New Mexico is federal land. But they lease, you know, they lease for mining, they lease for, um, you know, uranium mining, copper mining, coal mining. They just refuse to, to repatriate that land to the native people because they, they want to do away with reservations, but legally they, they don't know how they can do it because when they're created by treaty, they can't do it. So this is, um, these militias, these rural militias, uh, they call them, are, you know, mostly really wealthy landowners in the West, not your ordinary, you know, like the image of, you know, just some rednecks uh, who hate Indians. Uh, it's, it's really a wealthy class of people, uh, well-to-do. They're very uh, sparsely populated, and they have... Um, they have two senators, each of them, just like we do in California, as the most populous state. They're basket cases, you know, we support them, but they have representation, Senate representation, equal with New York or uh, California. So they're very powerful. So they use the courts, they use the system, they have the money to do it, but they also keep up this tradition of the militias. You know, this, this white nationalism is manifest in these people who have guns, but it represents a huge, you know, a really, um, a large mass base, if you think about it. The gun connection, you know, like the NRA, um, the National Rifle Association got taken over by these people, white nationalists, in 1977. Before that, it was kind of recreational, what they call recreational 
shooting, hunting and fishing stuff and kind of clubby. It was all white, but it was um, not pernicious. Uh, there were no gun laws uh, on the books, basically. Uh, but when they did raise one in the 1930s, the Thompson machine gun uh, was the first automatic weapon, like an AK-47 or an M-40, um, you know, the, the, a war weapon. And the National Rifle Association um, came, uh, were invited in to make a comment about banning it, and they were, they said, no, no problem. That's really the only law on the books you know, federal. So NRA was, you know, this dues-paying nonprofit. There were always quite quite a lot of guns. There were a hundred million um, firearms in uh, in 19, uh, 1980. A million firearms in individual individual hands. There, were, uh, but there were a hundred million people. Rarely would someone own more than one gun. And now today there are 300 million firearms in civilian hands and 300 million people. So it sounds like, you know, it's kind of the same thing, but actually only 30% of, um, of that 300 million own guns. So the average gun owner owns eight. And 62% um, of gun owners are white men. What was going on around that time that the NRA shifted? It wasn't at all, it wasn't, you know, Confederates or anyone else that formed the NRA. So it, it was a pretty benign organization until 1977. Well, what was happening um, is that this, you know, the, there's a resurgence of white nationalism. It's not the Klan, it's, um, and it's, it's, specifically related to the Supreme Court and the um, desegregation decision of 1954. Uh, two years later, the John Birch Society uh, is formed, a white nationalist organization with an armed uh, uh, guerrilla group, the Minutemen. They came to basically have the whole Pentagon, you know, in the end, these right-wingers. They were a very wealthy group. This was um, like Fred Koch, um, the father mm -hmm. of the Koch brothers, was a founding member. Uh, these were billionaires. Um, Welch was the candy fortune man. And they, um, uh, their one goal was, you know, to uh, impeach Earl Warren, who was the Supreme Court Justice uh, made the Brown versus Board of Education decision. And I grew up seeing those signs all over in rural Oklahoma, impeach Earl Warren. And um, I didn't quite even know who he was, but um, they were just very noticeable everywhere that it was all, all over in uh, white nationalist territory. So the John Birch Society um, formed chapters all over the place and they, um, they became very powerful, especially in California. Uh, Reagan and Nixon both were very, you know, very close to the, you know, the political, the politics that brought all these California right wingers to national office um, were was, uh, you know, really the John Birch Society had had a great deal to do with it, and the military industrial complex in California, um, and oil and gas, you know, so. California has a lot of a lot to do with this, even though we're um, pretty liberal now. Um, it uh, it was it, it it really had a fascistic uh, tone to it. Um, so we have to take some responsibility here and not say, "Oh, it's just the South," you know, it's just or the Southern migrants that came in. It just, you know it. It has its own history, and it's a history also of you know how capitalism is reforming itself and readjusting itself after uh, World War II. Um, but the um, all these groups sprang up, uh, right wing groups. The Klan didn't really appear that much until the uh, you know really mass uprisings with civil rights. Then. It, 
in some ways it was the sheriffs putting on hoods at night. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it's still this slave patrol kind of thing in the South. And it was, uh, but it was, did spread to all these industrial places where African Americans had migrated for jobs out of the totalitarian South. And then during the war to the defense industry on the West Coast. Uh, so the, this, you know, the Ku Klux Klan was very active in these industrial areas. Other groups that formed were just, there were myriad groups. So one that formed was actually called the Second Amendment Foundation. And this was, you know, this is a real marker, you know, it was, it was formed in 1972. It's very interesting, the person who founded it was a man named Harlan Carter. And Harlan Carter had, uh, he came from a family of um, border patrolmen on the Mexican border uh, in Texas. His father was a, uh, a border patrolman and he became a border patrolman. When he was a teenager, he actually shot uh, a Mexican kid and was not even convicted for it. He just got by with it. Uh, he was vicious. He was the he was the border chief in charge of Operation Wetback, the deportation of uh, over a million Mexicans, many of them U.S. citizens, or you know, completely, almost all of them, completely legal. Uh, but this is in the 1950s, um, and that was called that, you know, in the legislation, Operation Wetback, and he was the head of it, of deporting. Uh, Mexicans and um, uh, he then formed this uh, Second Amendment Foundation. He moved up to Eastern Washington, that you know, white nationalists. Uh, um, they they call you know they want to be a separate nation. They actually talk about being a white nation that will separate. But I think it, it he had the vision of infiltrating and taking over the NRA. I think he had the vision. The thing is, that's what he did, so I'm assuming it was intentional. They now have five million members. They had about a million when it got taken over, uh, but only a few were active. You know, only a few ran the thing. So they basically just took a lot of members in purposely to outvote and they took over in 1977. They, the Second Amendment Foundation took over, and that's when they, they put, put it up on the building, and you know this is their thing. And then a couple of years later, even more rabid white nationalists overthrew the Har overthrew Harlan Carter, who could hardly be a more evil person than that, but they did. So it by the time Reagan came in. It was a hardcore white nationalist organization, and it's been that ever since. And now you see NRA TV pushes this kind of apocalyptic propaganda, saying their president showing Barack Obama, showing Black Lives Matter in the streets. Then you look at the modern militias who claim to be some sort of barrier to impending government tyranny, yet you see their actions, whether it's the anti-looting actions, uh, you know, in the aftermath of hurricanes, yeah. or, um, you know, kind of confronting, again, Black Lives Matter protesters, things like this. And then you see Trump, you're talking about these, these land battles right here, where he's talking about giving land back to the people, right? Exactly. And then he says, um, or he's not just saying it, he's doing it, pardoning people like Joe Arpaio, right. pardoning members of the Bundy militia. Yeah. Tie all this together for us. There is a there is a really popular base. This is what I try to tell people. You can't just take these characters, white nationalists. I mean, it is important to do bio of them. You know how they think and what they do and how they run things. Uh, but there's a a huge population that agrees with the fundamentals of. Um, of, uh, of white nationalism has this, you know, built into our um, uh, subconscious, you know, from the very beginning. I know I grew up uh, with our, uh, our fundamental hymn in, in the Baptist church was, are you washed in the blood of the Lord? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? 
are you washed in the blood of a... So I always say, you know, you wash in blood, it's going to be red. You know, I couldn't understand that. That meant shedding blood. You know, there's a kind of blood... The descriptions of, of fascist Germany, and also now, you know, um, I didn't include it uh, in this book because I discovered these several books and articles that have come out that are documenting the um, Nazi regime borrowing U.S. Uh, practices, the reservation system, the segregation, the ethnic cleansing, um, the Liebenstrom, you know, the expansion across, because um, they expanded, you know, the Liebenstrom to have German settlers replace Polish and Lithuania and, of course, all, all Jews in, in the East. And they were, um, they were writing down and using, you know, U.S. Uh, eugenics as well. It was created in the United States by U.S. scientists. So, you know, we have so much in, in the culture itself that I think isolating um, the craziest kind of white nationalists, um, most of them are very rational and very organized and very... Um, um, they're growing, you know, they're, they're using different tactics. The Klan especially has developed this, uh, this concept of leaderless organizing, mm -hmm. having these secret groups that were leaderless and just making up their own thing but had a common uh, ideology that everyone accepted and basically is white nationalism. You know, it's it's interesting that you're talking, you know, you can acknowledge how we got here. Obviously, none of this happened in a vacuum. Trump is not an aberration. In fact, he's a, more of a reflection. However, he does still pose a very serious threat, right? This kind of fascist threat. And so touch upon just, you know, the pardoning and that message, like, what is he signaling to these people? Yeah, I hope everyone will um, uh, make themselves watch these stadium speeches he gives. They always, Fox News always broadcasts beginning to end. In fact, two hours before when the, you know, they're gathering around and he's flying in and he puts the airplane right there where he's speaking and it's this huge, mammoth, you know, this huge, like an airspace he's come from another, another planet it's or something. God. I mean, it is, it's a whole performance thing. So it's not just his rhetoric, it's this whole, thing and he's doing it now almost every night. Well that is so, um, such an echo of, <laughs> uh, of uh, um, the Nazis, you know, using that, purposely using that, that tactic of these stadium speeches for Hitler. And I think it, it can't not be um, uh, something he's consciously, you know, mimicking. Uh, and, and it's working, and these people who are the white nationalists that the NRA is, they are themselves a contained group of white nationalists. They're different ones. But what they have in common with the, all these other groups of white nationalists is that they're armed. You know, we, we're closer now to a kind of... Um, uh, right-wing insurgency. The interesting thing is, you know, that Trump is in power, that they actually have their own in government and in Congress and in states, governors, you know, governors of most states now are, are these white nationalists. Well, I just read a study that said that 19 million Americans identify with neo-Nazism. Yeah. It is encouraging to see demonstrations of, you know, tens of thousands of people to fight against bigotry and racism, but I think that the fact that there are so many right-wing extremists who are heavily armed and actually have stockpiles and arsenals of weapons that people really could feel completely hopeless and demoralized at yeah. where we're going, especially when other people are saying, you know, we could have a civil war here. Yeah. I guess what's your message to, you know, people on the left and progressives who do feel that way? Everything has become focused on getting rid of Trump, but um, there are so many in the wings, you know, that are not unlike Trump that 
I think, you know, they've been at this for now for 60 years, you know, I would say since the, um, since the formation of the John Birch Society. Um, and they've been very, uh, you know, they know what they're doing. You know, th this was to them uh, the end of the world, segregation. But they do feel like now they're the victims, you know, and their new narrative is that they're becoming a minority. So it's still so clear that the, it's a, you know, it's a, a white republic still. Talk about the mass shooting epidemic briefly and why, I mean, there are other settler colonial states, right? And right. we don't see that epidemic. Right. So do you think that it's just a tie-in with just the gun obsession and the empire baby syndrome? I mean, what is happening here? That's really important uh, that, you know, there are, uh, there are three other almost identical to the United States settler states in terms of uh, being British settler colonialism, you know, in the same sort of longer time period, uh, United States, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. And um, they, they have um, their races uh, that was violent, violent in those countries, is just as violent, certainly in Australia, even more so. I mean, they basically were, um, you know, hunted down Tasmanians uh, for sport and killed them all. I mean, practically wiped out the whole population of, of the island of Tasmania that belongs to Australia. So every, I mean, genocidal. But several things, um, none of those countries have constitutions, did not have, uh, you know, the whole basis of their economy based on, based on uh, s slave, you know, slavery their formation based on slavery. They also didn't uh, become the largest capitalist states in the world. So the difference is it's a, it's a matter of scale and just the, the enormity of the United States. The ideology of white nationalism never having like uh, something like the Klan in the past because they didn't have slave patrols. They, but I think it's important that they, didn't, they don't have constitutions. They don't have, most countries in the world either don't have constitutions or they have multiple ones. You know, they keep writing new ones depending on the times, including European countries. And yet they have laws, you know, it's not, we think we can't, the constitution is like a thing, you know, it's, it's like, um, and the Supreme Court's like these, you know, these uh, these gods that look into, a, you know, and kind of interpret it. And it's really weird, you know, if you have any idea of comparative history, it's just weird. There's so many weird things about the United States. The Constitution is like a fetish, and the Second Amendment is a super fetish within a fetish. <laughs> this sacred right, you know. I mean, when I hear, you know, other people asking about it, you know, they say, what? they're so puzzled, you know, why these, why, why are there more civilians with guns in the United States uh, per capita than Yemen? Is it war? <laughs> why is this? But the mass shootings, uh, they do occur in other places. Australia had a you know, a horrific one. It's like 40 or some people over on, in Tasmania. Um, and that guy he was ideologically, uh, you know, he was, uh, he was kind of a right winger. But um, they immediately put through a law banning, you know, practically banning the ownership of guns. And everyone supported it. Well, we can't even imagine that here. You know, they had one mass shooting and they banned all guns, you know. Canada had that one, you know, where it was clearly directed at women in Montreal, that uh, engineering school, the engineering women students. Um, and they Im immediately enacted, you know, all kinds of restrictions on guns, you know, the popular. So, so there's not that base of gun owners who, you know, it, it's, it's no big deal if something happens, let's, you know, nip it in the bud. And let, whereas here, it's just the proliferation of guns alone 
what would gun laws even do, you know, unless you had a whole army inspecting people's houses and things, you know, that can't do under any international law or anything else. We empower objects. I mean, that's normal human behavior. We empower things. Um, the Zuni empower uh, Kashina dolls, you know, that then there's, it's not um, psychotic for that to happen. But when we empower something that is made only to kill uh, something living, you know, you can kill, you can kill with anything. You can pick up a chair, you can kill someone, knock them to the ground. But nothing else is created for that sole purpose. It has no other purpose than that. And to have a, a mass fetish of that, that's really problematic. And I don't think anywhere else in the world, you know, I don't think it's human nature because it just doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. You know, most guns you have to work with a lot and you have to clean them and you have to oil them and you have to, you know, and it literally, a relationship can develop. And that's what I think is, um, also unique in the United States is that relationship with guns. I call that gun love, you know, people getting infatuated with, uh, uh, with the object itself because it's a beautiful object and it's an amazing mechanism, you know, and it's made for one thing, to kill. How could you not feel powerful? You get that in your head. Yes, I feel empowered. Is this really what you want to call power? That you can kill someone? Um, it's it's a kind of insanity that, that, that infiltrates almost everyone. An insecure individual who doesn't have their full ego intact or um, a man who doesn't have his image of masculinity intact or whatever, you know, this can be the solution, you know, until it's the problem. It can be the solution. So I do think there is a, you know, a addiction to guns. Um, and it, it's so related to the fact that the whole, um, you know, that it's been a militaristic society from the very beginning. War, we haven't even talked about the connection with war. The United States was established as a fiscal military state, that the Constitution actually establishes a fiscal military state. So. The United States has, has this peculiar history, and I think it is an exceptional country, you know, not in that way that they say, <laughs> the American exceptionalism. But a lot of liberals want to make, normalize the United States. It's sort of like how uh, pro-Zionists want to normalize Israel and say, it's just another country. Well, I'm sorry, it was created by the UN, you know in 1948, it's not like just another country. And it, you know, it, 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 it's other people's land, you know, it has, to, it's, it is basically like in a, a, a capsule United States history and kind of copied from what the United States did. The United States is exceptional in that same way. And you can't, you can't just say it's, uh, uh, Trump is not being normal. It's not like we haven't had, we had Andrew Jackson, you know, who Trump has his picture behind him, you know, on the wall, that's his hero, that um, a genocidal maniac. And so it's not as if Trump is completely out of step <laughs> with um, the U.S., it, except this veneer of being a normal country. And it seems like that's the thing that bothers liberals the most, is how we look, you know, rather than what it means. You know, what is he a um, uh, uh, indication of? It does seem like they're upset that Trump has uh, made this sanctity of the position of presidency, just, you know, he's diminishing this kind of sacred institution, which is just absolutely absurd. And why is this history so important to factor in when addressing policy prescriptions to deal with this? Like I say, the fetish of the Second Amendment, the Constitution, you don't put um, restraints on an absolute right, like the freedom of speech. But these originalists, you know, who are now in power, 
uh, in the Supreme Court, the Federalist Society originalists, that also started after the Civil Rights Movement, you know, that, that the court should be, um, um, Supreme Court should interpret what exactly, figure out what the founders meant by this and that, you know, in the Constitution. And basically, they want to stop at the Tenth Amendment, which means, you know, slavery and women's right to vote and, you know. I could see some kind of amendment like all federal lands uh, should be privatized, you know, that it's unfair to the, the population that they don't have, you know, the right to buy and sell that land as a commodity. I could see that probably passing because of the makeup of, of Congress and all. A lot of the f bearers of the left that, you know, are Marxists and theorists and all are uh, still so Eurocentric that it's very hard to get them to focus on the reality of the United States. You know, it's, it's like they want a different country to analyze. And unfortunately, we're stuck with this one. <laughs> so it's the rest of the world. So I think we really have to face up to the hard task of figuring out, you know, exactly what the, that, that's exactly what I get out of Marx is historical materialism. He did his thing at that time and that place in Europe. But the point is to use that methodology to look exactly at this society, how everything works. Maybe we could just figure out what the United States is about, do something. You know, things can happen very fast mm -hmm. if you put your mind to it.